Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Council for Higher Education Accreditation International Quality Group webinar on institutional autonomy and quality assurance. I am Judith Eaton. I am the president of CHIA here with my colleague, Stemenko Blistrumbic, Senior Advisor for International Affairs for CHIA. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jamil Sami, global tertiary education expert, who will be our moderator for our session today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. First of all, I hope that you are all well and safe in these challenging times of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had initially planned to limit access to this webinar to the first 200 registered persons, but we've had so many expressions of interest that I'm told that we will have more than 200 participants today. And I don't know whether it's because everyone is so bored being confined at home or if you are really excited as I am about the topic of this webinar. In any event, I would like to welcome you all to what promises to be a great 90 minute session. In the many countries in the world where we have mixed provision of higher education, you often find that the top private university is as prestigious, sometimes even more in demand than the top public institutions. This is the case not only in the US, but in some emerging countries in Latin America, for example, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, or in Asia, I think, for example, Pakistan or the Philippines. I happen to live in Colombia, so let me share an, a true anecdote from this country. A few years back, the president of the top public university, it's called Universidad Nacional, meets the president of the top private university, Los Andes, at a, and they start chatting, and the president of the public university tells the other one, do you know why your life is much easier than mine? It is because you have more resources and a much higher salary. But the president of the private university responds, not at all. The main difference between you and me is that I can make decisions. Indeed, in many countries in the world, public universities are often tied by many regulations and constraints, starting with the civil service status of their staff. And this happens even in rich OECD countries with only public universities. I have watched, for example, how German universities, winners of the Excellence Initiative, had to create parallel administrative structures and processes because the normal rules and regulations were too cumbersome to manage the additional resources that they received in a flexible manner. So this webinar is about considering two major questions. First, how important institutional autonomy for the quality and effectiveness of high education institutions. And second, in the second part, we will try to answer the following question. How does quality assurance contribute to sustaining and enhancing institutional autonomy? And I feel really privileged to moderate such a distinguished panel. We have four panelists today. I would like to introduce them very briefly. First, I would like to introduce Gulam Mohamed Bey from Mauritius. He's very well known to all of us as the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Mauritius and also the former Secretary General of the Association of African Universities. From Serbia, we have Professor Sabianka Turajilic, who is by profession a professor of electri electrical engineering, but also has been for several years the deputy minister of education in Serbia. And finally, from Hong Kong, from the University of Hong Kong, we have Professor Kaiming Cheng, emeritus professor of education and former dean of the Faculty of Education, and Helen Loki 
who is currently a senior assistant registrar at the University of Hong Kong. Prior to that, she established the Office of Academic Quality Assurance at the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts and led the validation accreditation of his performing art degrees. Now, I'm told that Professor Kai Ming Chang will speak on behalf of the team from the University of Hong Kong. So how are we going to sequence this uh, webinar? Each of the panelists is going to make a short statement about the first question from the viewpoint of their own experience and the conditions in their part of the world. And then I will invite you, the participants, to ask questions. And we're going to use the chat function, please, uh, the chat function in Zoom for this purpose. So as, as you have questions or comments, please don't feel shy and uh, send them to, to us. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Serbianka, who is going to start today. Good morning, good day, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I hope that you are not only well, but that you are going to remain well till the end of this uh, madness all around the world. Well, I got three minutes to express my views on the subject. So I shall start immediately with the basic question, do we need institutional autonomy of the university? And if I invoke my personal experience, I end up with three different, I would say rather confusing answers. 40 years spent at the University of Belgrade in Serbia, in Europe actually, swayed me to absolutely yes. Four years spent as a deputy minister in charge of higher education in Serbia converted me to absolutely not. Uh, two years spent as a visiting professor in California, USA, convinced me that the answer should be, but of course. And to explain these three answers, the rationale really goes as follows. Well, absolutely yes is the answer you will hear from the entire academic community in Europe. And it is based on our conviction that we, the academics, know better than anybody else what is the university and how it should be run. So just give us the money and leave us alone to do it. This is the essence of the Magna Carta Universitatum written by the European academics in 1989. Maybe uh, everybody will not agree with my reading of this Magna Carta, but I ask you to read it yourself and you will realize that that's the essence of what we said to our governments. Absolutely not come from the other side. Basically from my ministerial period and extremely unsuccessful efforts to explain to the academics that they cannot continue with their 800 year old practice of educating the elite. They were not ready and are still not ready to accept that today we require at least 80% of the cohort to enter higher education. Whereas obviously all of them cannot become elite. And that all disciplines to which we are used had intervened in many ways to create new ones which we are not recognizing. The proof that I was not alone with this problem in my ministry is the so-called Bologna process through which over 40 governments joined together to impose higher education reforms in Europe. None of the government considered itself to be capable of doing it alone. Hence our universities within last decade, decade and a half, have been reorganized through ministerial joint decrees with some involvement of the academics. But all the time we were and still are locked in mutual distrust. For now, it seems to me like an impasse in which the universities are still winning uh, because they are implementing some rather perfunctory reforms while most of the governments are preoccupied with the next election where due to the short timeline, neither success nor failure of university would be recognized. Finally, I need to explain the third answer. Uh, my American colleagues would answer 
that they need autonomy since they're competing on a crowded market for students and grants. So they have to use all their resources to place themselves at the best possible position. And I guess that is the real answer. Institutions should have autonomy. After all, freedom is the prerequisite for any creativity, but it has to be accompanied with an accountability towards the students and the society. To achieve this, we have to provide a clear feedback indicated the level of achievement, and that is what is missing in Europe. Hence, if we, the question is really how we can sustain and enhance autonomy at the European universities, we first have to establish its really meaning and consequences for autonomy, which I think is deeply missing, and this is something we can discuss later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, for this very provocative and original way of presenting the dilemmas of autonomy. Moving to the African region, Gulam, uh, do you agree? Are you a friend or foe of autonomy? Thank you, Jamil, and uh, uh, hello to all the participants from all parts of the world but uh, special greetings from my friends and colleagues from Africa, those who are attending this uh, webinar. What I'm going to do is to talk about the state of institutional autonomy in Africa generally. So I'll look at institutional autonomy in public universities with an African perspective. Let me start with a simple definition. Institutional autonomy means a university's power to manage and govern itself without undue interference. In Africa, the main factors that have an impact on institutional autonomy in public universities are government and politics. There is direct and indirect interference by government. It has been there, but it appears to be increasing. So why does, why does government interfere? I believe there are three main reasons. The first one is lack of democracy. In 2018, it, a study found that there were only about 20 to 25 percent of African countries which could be considered as free democracies. In non-democratic countries, government can silence public opposition, but silencing university students and academics is much more difficult, hence interference measures. The second reason is lack of accountability of universities. There are still many universities, public universities, that don't submit audited accounts or annual reports, and yet they receive public funds. The third reason is to get universities to implement measures that government considers of national importance, justifiably so perhaps, but which universities may not find acceptable. These, I think, are probably the three main reasons. And how does this government interference take place in African public universities? The first one is by the appointment of the vice chancellor, rector, or president, whatever you call it, the chief executive officer, basically. And in many countries, this appointment is directly made by government. And the appointee then owes allegiance to government. A second uh, method is by representation on the university's governing council. In many cases, the majority of council members are nominees of government and they control council's decisions. A third method is through legislation. The university statutes are amended to legalize some of the above measures that I have mentioned. And also, very often there is an inclusion of a clause that the responsible minister can give directives to council, which the latter has to implement. Another method is through the creation of a national higher education council or commission, which is usually not independent. Most African countries now have such a council or commission, and that agency can set admission criteria for students, decide on accreditation of programs, 
decide on qualifications of academic staff, etc., etc. And finally, another final method is by political infiltration of the student's body. Political parties, not just government, but all political parties, usually have a youth wing and they enroll university students as members who then influence students' decision on campus. To conclude, I would like to say that it is difficult to generalize for the whole continent of 54 countries, but one could say that achieving institutional autonomy in the majority of public African universities is a challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulam, for these inspiring comments. And now we move to our third speaker, Kai Ming Cheng, in at the University of Hong Kong. You are mute, Kai Ming. Uh, I don't claim that I can represent Asia. This is this is the most uh, diverse continent uh, with so many languages and so many religions, and uh, the the politics, political cultures are also very different. I can only explain to you uh, what happened in my own system, uh, which is somehow related to nearby systems. Either either they are with a Chinese tradition or with the tradition of a British colony. Uh, I, personally, I think institutional autonomy is a matter of governance. And uh, this is important because why don't we don't want interference? It's because academic institutions are um, given the mission to explore the unexplored and to uh, find and to all do all this uh, on uncharted paths. And nobody else can tell us what to do uh, because we are doing, we are trying to discover what is unknown. And in this case, the governance very much is interfered either by government funding or by politics. It's lucky that although we have a lot of politics in Hong Kong, the uh, governance structure is still there. Uh, there are two levels. One is universities, like in other countries, universities are governed by ordinance, by law. We are not working under any minister, a ministry. And second, the, between the government, which gives us money, the funding body, and the institutions, there's a buffer layer, which happens in, still in some of the uh, former British colonies, is what we call University Grants Committee, which is composed of 15 people, one third local academics, one third academics overseas, and one third local community leaders. And there's no government uh, uh, presence. They will hand the money, uh, they get the money from government and hand the money to us. And that itself uh, preserves the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, institutional autonomy. And so far, uh, because of the uh, party politics and because of the uh, other political, even with the students' political movements, I don't think that is being moved. And all polit political parties seem to say that this should be preserved. Quality assurance is a different story to us. Quality assurance is more within the institutions on how how well you are doing your teaching and research. But most of the time, research has its own institution, its, its protocols, and very much uh, quality assurance refers very much more in our parts of the world, and I can say that for most of the other countries, on teaching. And there are three layers of protection. One is the, uh, the faculty boards in each university has a say over the admissions, the curriculum, 
the teaching, the examination, graduation. These are the basic elements about quality assurance here. Then it could be different in other countries. The second layer is for each subject, because we are universities which are given the, uh, the autonomy to have our own accreditation, self-accreditation. Therefore, for each course, we have an external examiner, most of the time from other countries, prominent academics. So this is a second layer of, of uh, protection of uh, quality. But then the University Grants Committee, as I said earlier, has also a quality assurance committee, which tries to look at all the institutions one by one, not on the result of quality, but whether the quality assurance mechanism and procedures are in position. So this is what we are having now in Hong Kong and in many other systems like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, or even mainland China, they are more or less, of, or more or less similar. And uh, we have connections with many other countries in Southeast Asia and uh, East Asia, and they more or less are going towards that direction. Uh, but how these two will interact, I really don't know. In our case, there are two planes that don't uh, cross. The only thing I can think of is people may mistake quality assurance for accountability. And therefore, accountability can be taken as a basis for intervention. I'm not so sure this is the case. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kaiming. The three of you have already outlined one of the major dilemma that uh, we face in high education system, uh, the tension between autonomy and accountability. Um, I think Gulam has made a very strong case for protecting universities from undue interference. But at the same time, when from the viewpoint of minister or viewpoint of society, you want to have more accountability. And one of the first questions that has come to us uh, from India is how do you prevent universities from abusing uh, their autonomy and living, experiencing it or living it as total independence? Um, so any of you who would like to address this first question? Let me have a go. Let me have a go, Jamil. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Right. I would, and clear. Yeah. I, I, I would say uh, precisely in having, very, having a very strong system of external quality assurance and internal quality assurance. Um, universities can't just think that because they are money, they are supposed to be independent and they are not accountable. Um, uh, they, they need to be accountable to society, to, you know, to government and so on. And the way to do it is precisely through quality assurance, external quality assurance, but at the same time to have a system of internal quality assurance, which then can report and provide information to, uh, you know, the ex quality assurance agencies, which does the external quality assurance. And that would be my suggestion. Uh, may I join Thank in? you, Gulam. Please. Please, Yabianka, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, quality assurance uh, won't, will help uh, certainly something, but in my mind, you need to have, you need to establish a clear relationship between the societal needs and the university with unfortunately the government since we are talking about public institutions mostly the government being the intermediary in between the two so we need to know what we need as a country and what we expect our universities to fulfill and then we can start to talk about quality and so on and i think that the main misunderstanding at least is you in europe is what we need and what they are doing. 
And if you look, uh, you mentioned Germany in your introductory speech. What Germany did as a rich, uh, great country, they said, okay, we cannot force you to do what we want, but at least we can give money to some who are going to do what we want, and then we'll see what we are going to do with the rest of you. That's how we came to Center of Excellences. Prior to Center of Excellences, all 3,000 universities in Europe were considered to be excellent. They were all giving all three levels of studies. All degrees are more or less the same. So we had 3,000 excellent research universities in Europe. Now, at least in Germany, you have 10. And I think that that's the problem. That's why we are fighting for our autonomy. That's how I am understanding the whole idea. Uh, Thank it, you, Sabianca. Okay. Kaimin, any uh, reaction? In our case, and when you say abuse, I'm thinking, searching in my mind, uh, what is meant by abusing. Uh, the major abuse is how you abuse the public money and do things that are uh, either not needed or not wanted. Um, so the financial control is uh, as a matter of mechanism is essential. Uh, in our case, as academics, you always feel that the financial control is a little bit too heavy, too strict. You go through many, many layers of, uh, of accountability. However, uh, when you come to politics, then it is a different, different matter. Uh, I, I can't think of a third dimension finance, politics, and what is the third dimension of abuse, uh, then it may, may be really a matter of, of quality. Uh, for example, in some countries, they admit too many students, and uh, therefore, uh, it's a very poor quality. Then it's a matter of difference between quality assurance and quality. I always argue that in many systems in our parts of the world, Quality assurance is a mechanism that refers to the procedures, but not to the actual quality. So you have a low expectation of quality, you are guaranteeing low quality. So who decides the quality is essential. And that perhaps depends on the whole academic culture of the system in that country. Uh, may I answer, there is a question, I guess, Address to myself uh, whether sub-excellent uh, universities don't need autonomy. Obviously they do. It's not the question that you will give autonomy only to those who are good. It's the question of how you are going to organize your excellent and sub-excellent universities to fulfill their role, role towards society. And this has to be done if the university itself, by, for any reason, don't recognize what should be its role in a society, then somebody has to help it to recognize this. That's the whole uh, point. Otherwise, you leave everybody alone to do whatever they feel like doing and you won't uh, get uh, anything done. Now, so far we've been talking about autonomy as if it's a one single concept but we know that in reality it's much more complex than that and there are several dimensions of autonomy in the case of the, the in Europe the Association of European Universities has defined autonomy along four main categories organizational uh, staffing financial and academic autonomy and one of the participants from Afghanistan is asking us how do you reconcile academic autonomy and financial autonomy? Um, if you don't have financial autonomy, can you have genuine academic autonomy? Would anyone, uh, Kaiming, you, I see that you, this touches you. Would you like to take that or Gulam, any one of you? Yeah, I would think uh, finance is obviously one of the deciding factors. Uh, but you can also see in 
uh, in some countries where the financial situation is not that strong, but you can still have uh, institutions of excellence. And uh, there are limits, for example, uh, of course, but then it doesn't mean, because excellence is defined in different ways in different societies. It's about how, in those cases, the best universities are the best ones who can economize their, their, their funding, they can uh, create their own resources and try to achieve whatever is possible given the, uh, the, the restrictions, the constraints. I think it is possible. Almost in all systems, there are, there are excellent universities under financial constraints. Yeah. Jamil, can I, can I say a few words? Please, do this, that. Is, this, is, this is a very interesting question. And I think it relates a little bit to your introduction. You know, if you, if you look at the uh, University of Belgrade, if you look at the University of Hong Kong, uh, and, and my presentation, it was all slanted towards public universities, universities which are public funded. But let's not forget the private universities. In Africa, at least, there are more private higher education institutions than there are public higher education institutions. And one assumes that in, in, in private higher education institutions, they have complete financial autonomy. They don't rely on government to get the money. They, they, you know, they're, they're independent of government. And the question that was asked about uh, academic autonomy and uh, financial autonomy, that comes in here. Uh, I presume what is meant by academic autonomy is a little bit academic freedom. And what has been observed, generally speaking, that those private universities which may have you know, institutional autonomy in the sense that they don't depend on anybody, they have their own money, they can do whatever they like. Academic freedom is a very different story. They may have very, very difficult situations of academic freedom in private institutions, institutions which are completely private, because everything is done centrally by the body that funds the university and so on. So I think it's, a, it's not an easy question, and one, has, uh, uh, one can't always link autonomy to finance uh, in, in, in the setting of higher education. Higher education is a, is a different animal altogether, and we mustn't link always money to it from the point of view of uh, freedom and autonomy. Well, if I may uh, join, uh, Europe didn't have private universities till globalization, till recently. Uh, now you have the majority of private universities are in Eastern European countries, have been established during the 90s, and majority of them are really diploma mills. Uh, so we do not have, I would say, uh, experience with really good, decent private institutions. And uh, they are autonomous. They do what they basically want to do. Uh, the question is uh, naturally on accreditation, why you accredit them, how you accredit them, and so on. So uh, I'm not uh, sure that when you talk about autonomy, at least in Europe, uh, private institutions are the big issue. Unless as a government, as a society, you, have, you find a way to expose those private universities as, as being the fake ones. And I think that that really is the major problem in Eastern Europe, European countries. Um, it's Bianca, um, I, I understand the situation in Europe, but the situation in Africa is completely different. As I said, um, now the majority of institutions are private institutions, not public institutions. And uh, to be frank, uh, there are many, many private institutions which are excellent. They are well known. The majority of them are faith-based, it is true. But in some cases, they're even better than public universities. So I think we should not generalize too much and just say that, you know, the private institutions are not good. Some of them are extremely good. They apply very good principles. They have good internal quality assurance systems and they do a marvelous job. But there are also probably the majority, which are really the sort of diploma mills you're talking about. So we have to, 
you know, and Africa needs the private institutions. It cannot, the higher education sector will not be able to meet the requirement of um, Africa's manpower if there are no private institutions. We need the private institutions, but we need good private institutions. Look, uh, Goham, I'm not against private institutions, but I'm telling that in, in my mind, private institution should find itself on the market. And somehow it has to be controlled by the market. If it's good, it will have uh, a lot of students, but only the role of the government, of the society, in my mind, is that somebody has to point out to the public which private institution is good, which is not. And I think that this is uh, something that is missing here. For, for us here, all the private in, uh, universities are private universities. None of them at this point is good. Some of them are more or less decent, but nothing more than decent. So I am not against private institutions. As such. I just think that they should be controlled in different ways. Emil? Interestingly, one of the questions that came to us was about the Central European University, an example of good quality private institution in, uh, in Europe, which has met with uh, political interference to the point that it had to move away from uh, Budapest to Vienna. Um, one, uh, you raised, uh, so Bianca, you raised the issue of uh, labor market results in, and we also got a question on that. Um, the question is, to what extent uh, results of labor market surveys or labor market observatories uh, something negative or positive in terms of institutional autonomy? Anybody would like to take this point? Now, in, in, in our part of all that I can say about uh, various systems in uh, Asia, in the past 20 years, there is a fundamental uh, orientation that the public and the private sectors are uh, becoming, uh, the, 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 the distinction between public and private sectors are becoming blurred. That is, public institutions have to get private money and private institutions are getting more and more public money. The public institution, the typical example is Japan. Before 2002, Japan, all the public institutions are not allowed to do any fundraising. But once they are in so-called incorporated, they begin to have fundraising. Fundraising in, the, in Asia, uh, in, in most of the countries, begins only about 20 years ago, and it is flourishing. On the other hand, government many in many places, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, and so on and so forth, the government is giving money to in private institutions through two channels. One is research funding, and second is student subsidy, student financial aid. And uh, the second one, of course, doesn't go into the pocket of the uh, institution directly, but the research funding has become a trend in this part of the world that governments are trying to put in as much money as possible to subsidize not only public research, uh, institutions in research but also private institutions in terms of research. Uh, Jamil, could I, uh, this issue of labor market is a very interesting one and uh, you see it very clearly that most of the private institutions uh, because some of them, most of them want to make sure that they survive and therefore they, they make money. Um, they would always make sure that they cater for the labor market. They would always make sure that their students eventually find employment, otherwise they will, some of them may go out of business. So it, in the past, the public institutions have taken probably in Africa, let me say, have taken a slightly different approach that we are not here to just supply uh, the labor market. We're here for, you know, the universities have got different missions and so on. But more and more, the evidence seems to be coming in that even public institutions cannot ignore the labor market. They must make sure that their students eventually, the graduates eventually, get a decent job. And unfortunately, in Africa, graduate unemployment is a very, very serious uh, situation. Some, some countries have got graduate employment figures which are in some cases frightening. 
And let's bring in that animal we haven't talked about so far, Jamil, COVID-19. More and more, we will find that uh, private companies will start to close down, uh, will uh, lay off their uh, workers because of the situation. They can't afford, they can't, you know, they can't continue to, um, to pay these people. And it will become even more difficult for graduates to find jobs now. So I think universities have a duty I think uh, public universities as well, as well have got a duty to ensure, not to ensure, but at least to keep an eye on the labor market and make sure that their graduates at least have a reasonable chance of getting employment once they graduate. Thank you, Gula. Now you, you mentioned, as you said, the elephant in the room, the terrible pandemic we are all experiencing. Do do the panelists think that the present crisis is likely to increase or decrease institutional autonomy? We see that in some countries, national governments are using emergency laws to take decisions, not only for the entire economy, but also for universities. So is that a threat to institutional autonomy? Do you think that once the crisis is over, we'll go, go back to business as usual? I think, Jamil, it's, um, um, yes, I think there will be a loss of autonomy. I think government will have to interfere more and more. But I have a feeling, you remember the reasons I was giving in. The first one was entirely political and a uh, completely different thing. But the other reasons was to think of the nation, to think of the, uh, you know, what is needed, what is important for the country. And government is in the right position to do so. And I think they will have to take certain decisions, which may be unpleasant, which may not be palatable to universities, but they will have to take them. Simple examples, like for example, admitting students when you don't have final year, good examination results from the secondary uh, school sector. For example, completely changing the academic uh, year because of the delay. Um, if you leave it to universities and each university decide what it wants to do, that's their autonomy, it will not work for the country. So I think we will lose a certain degree of autonomy, but in the crisis we are, I don't think we should look at it negatively. I think the universities should embrace, embrace it positively, work with government to make sure that whatever is done, to some extent, is in line with you know, their quality, what they are thinking uh, about doing, and also uh, what is important for the country. Sorry, Jamil, can I just jump in yes, here? Yes, Helen, please. Ah, yeah. um, it's a very interesting question. Do we think that governments um, are going to, I mean, in, in view of COVID-19, are we going to lose our institutional autonomy? I, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't speak for Kai Ming, but, um, and certainly jurisdictions around the world are very different. And Hong Kong, is um, I would say very generously funded in terms of higher education. That's number one. And um, we value education very, very highly here. So I, I don't think that we will lose. I mean, I'm speaking for Hong Kong. I don't think Hong Kong, you or indeed any of the other institutions will lose that autonomy. And um, I don't see the word interference being um, being used here. I mean, I think if anything, um, I mean, I'm quite I'm quite bullish about it. I think the Hong Kong government is going to do as do whatever it can to continue supporting um, our universities here. And and I think that in terms of um, you know quality, I, I you know I've been listening to the you know what's good, what's bad. I think one of the things that we have to think about in terms of quality assurance is not whether a university is good or bad, but how we can make universities better. All right, so, so the, the dialogue or the language that we use is, is not prescriptive, it's much more to do with enhancement. So personally, I like to use the word enhancement rather than assurance. So quality enhancement rather than quality assurance. Um, and I think that what we need to do is to think about how we can improve. I mean, even good universities like Hong Kong U, we can improve. There are lots of things we can do. And, you know, no one's ever perfect. So, but to, to come back to the autonomy issue, I don't think there's going to be less of it um, as a result of COVID. I think, I think there's going to be more support, actually, if not the, you know, the same support. And I don't know if Kai Ming in, uh, agrees with me. 
I, I, if I think aloud about the systems around us in Asia, uh, for example, Hong Kong, Taiwan, mainland China, Japan, uh, Singapore, and even like uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, I don't think for the time being, uh, COVID-19 uh, has affected the higher education sector yet. Now, in the end, the governments will lose because of the, uh, the production lines may be broken and the unemployment may be more. And uh, so government may have uh, less income and that might affect the public institutions. But uh, after all, for the time being, even if the, the, it depends on the political culture, of course, the role of the government as it sees itself. But up till now, I don't see any government in this part of the world is thinking of uh, uh, having a tighter control of universities. It's quite the opposite. Most of the jurisdictions are trying to trying to get loose and let the, the university flourish. Uh, but the financial situation, of course, will, will constrain what they, they can do here. So it might be a very different, I think from uh, I, I, when I listened to Gu Lang, I think there are two uh, dimensions that may differentiate different jurisdictions. One is the economy, the economic situation. For example, when you talk about employment, uh, in this part of the world, many systems here, and we've done a study for Asia Society uh, in 2016, most of the stu many students are not doing what they study. And therefore, university higher education policies are moving away from job readiness. But it's a different economy because uh, a lot of uh, startups, a lot of student uh, innovations, and therefore there are plenty of opportunities outside the traditional or the conventional labor market. But that doesn't mean that they don't want to have a work. But the the coronavirus will likely to increase unemployment very steeply. This is the, 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 the economy. But the political situation is also very different. How the government expects the universities, how the universities see themselves vis-a-vis -vis the government are quite different in different countries in this part of the world. Thank you, Gaimin. And I, I'm conscious of time and I think it's, uh, we could now move to the second question that uh, and Helen started to raise it to when she talked about quality assurance and quality enhancement. Uh, the, to what extent do quality assurance agencies through their criteria and procedures support, promote, facilitate autonomy or on the contrary can we see that the requirements for accreditation for quality assurance more generally are uh, experienced by institutions as constraints. Um, and then we could bring that also to the present situation. One of the facilitating measures that governments are uh, uh, supporting in the present crisis is regarding exams, regarding uh, accreditation processes. I think we should take that also into uh, context in uh, into consideration. Uh, we're gonna so I, I'm gonna ask each panelist to speak for three minutes on these topics, and we're gonna go in reverse order. This time we're gonna start with you, Kai Ming. And uh, yes, I'm still uh, struggling with this because uh, the only thing I can think of is that quality assurance can easily be uh, used as a matter of accountability, which is moving beyond the mechanism procedures, but look at what quality you want. And uh, if it is in the hands of government, the government said, this is not a quality we want, uh, this is the quality we want, and so on and so forth. And that might relate to what Golan was saying, whether it fits the labor market, it fits the economic development of that country, and so on and so forth. That's the only dimension I can see that quality assurance, when it is uh, interpreted as part of accountability, can become 
a matter of institutional autonomy. I don't need three minutes. That's all I want to say. Jamil? Thank you, Wu Keming. <laughs> yeah. I, I finished um, before the three minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Gulam, over to you. Yeah, OK. Um, again, I will, I will try and um, look at this issue of quality assurance and how it is linked to institutional autonomy from an African perspective, just as I did when looking at the institutional autonomy on itself. Let me, let me start by saying a few words about quality assurance agencies in Africa. Until recently, quality assurance of African universities was undertaken mostly by the National Higher Education Council or Commission or by Department of the Ministry of Higher Education. And neither of these two is really independent or autonomous. Gradually, African countries have been establishing dedicated quality assurance agencies. Currently, and these are actually 2019 figures, 35 of the 54 African countries in Africa have such a dedicated quality assurance agency. All of them are funded by government. There is no private quality assurance agency. And the majority of them are really not autonomous. Ensuring autonomy of the quality assurance agency, in my view, would be the first important step for achieving, for achieving institutional autonomy in universities. A major recent development in Africa has been the publication of the African Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance. And this was a joint initiative of the African Union and the European Union. The African standards and guidelines provide guidelines of three types for internal quality assurance of higher education institutions, for external quality assurance, and for internal quality assurance of the quality assurance agencies themselves. And this is very interesting. And the document clearly mentions that the basic principle in the um, African standards and guidelines is as follows. And I'm quoting there, the autonomy, identity, and integrity of higher education institutions must be acknowledged and respected. Further, under the guidelines for internal quality assurance for quality assurance agencies, it is mentioned that, and again, I'm quoting from that document, the quality assurance agencies shall be legally established as an autonomous body. Now, these are very powerful guidelines, very powerful statements. And I think the higher education sector must therefore use the African standards and guidelines as an instrument for promoting institutional autonomy, both in higher education institutions and in the quality assurance agencies, especially as the document has the approval of the African Union. Another interesting development that has been in, over the past few years has been the creation of several networks of quality assurance agencies at regional and continental level. These networks are not funded by government and they help the agencies to share experience among themselves. So a quality assurance agencies, a quality assurance agency which is not autonomous can use the network to benchmark itself with those agencies which are autonomous and hence promote its, case, promote its case for autonomy nationally. I'll conclude by saying that yes, in the African context, quality assurance can definitely help to enhance institutional autonomy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulam. How about Europe? Sir Bianca, over to you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, 
quality, as we all know, is measured as a fitness for purpose. Uh, we introduce different standards to ev evaluate our higher education. The groundwork of the quality assurance process and standard was led in Europe uh, during uh, 10 year old Bologna process, creating European higher education area. However, across Europe, the world standards uh, is used in a variety of ways, ranging from statements of narrowly defined regulatory requirements to more generalized description of good practice. The harmonization of the whole process is achieved through the European Network Accreditation Quality Assurance uh, whose members are national quality assurance agencies. All information can be found on the ECFA, web, ECFA website. So for those who don't know it and are interesting, I really uh, am just referring them to that website and I won't go into details. In essence, I would say that the whole QA process is well established and functional. And as the cover measure of quality, we introduce ranking and the famous Shanghai ranking list, uh, which really can go under the title publish or perish. So formally everything is okay, but then there is always but, and for those who know me, this but is not unexpected. The question that I would like to pose, and I'm not alone, uh, definitely, otherwise I wouldn't do it, is why we do not examine the quality of purpose, or as Stephenson put it, the fitness of purpose. Not only the fitness for purpose, but the fitness of the purpose itself. Declaratively, uh, and somebody had said it in the chat room now, we had agreed in Europe uh, upon the main purpose of education, like education for personal development, sustainable em employment, and ability to live as active citizen in democratic society, which is extremely important and going to be more important in the post COVID-19 society. Then we have research to develop and maintain the broad knowledge base. And the third part is res responsibility toward society in terms of environmental issues, trans transfer of knowledge and technology and so on. And the key word in all these competencies is a basic requirement, uh, including ability to learn for oneself and quickly fathom the new environment, which is very often forget, a belief in personal power to perform in new situations, power of judgment. In essence, somebody said this is flexible, uh, flexible professional, with integration of knowledge, skills, personal qualities, and all that. But it seems to me that we really have to combine, when we talk about quality assurance, competencies and purpose. As I already said, Europe has three, over 3,000 universities, and all of them formally equal, in terms of the degrees they are conferring and so on. And all of them measured by Shanghai ranking list, which the majority of them cannot make. And we, when you talk with students, they really don't want all of them. They don't aspire to become researchers. Some want to become researchers, some want to become professionals, some want to become entrepreneurs. And they will often ask you a question, do you know this and that university program? Uh, is it good? for research or maybe is it better in terms of employability and you usually don't know the answer because all of them have been measured by the same sticks with the same quality assurance standards so i think that the possible solution might be if we really put some effort in introducing a different ranking in different categories research universities entrepreneurship universities professional skills universities uh, whatever the list can be long and in that way each university will find its appropriate niche to compete and strengthen not only quality but this will give the provide this feedback i was uh, talking about at the beginning in applying autonomy in order to achieve attainable goal a shanghai list is not attainable goal 
all the universities in Europe or in the world. But there are very valuable, attainable goals to which we can pivot to them actually. And I think uh, better fulfill quality and needs of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serbianka. The other panelists, any reaction to each other's initial comments before we move to answering the questions of our participants? May, may um, I add one, one dimension? Uh, you talk about COVID-19. Uh, obviously, different institutions in different jurisdictions are to different extents increasing the component of online teaching, online learning. And the quality assurance for that is a totally different story. I'm not so sure how that would play out. Thank you. Um, I was going to take up the point of uh, uh, Sibianka about including fitness of purpose. Uh, in other words, look at quality assurance, not only from the fitness for purpose point of view, but also fitness of purpose. In other words, you don't just look at uh, a quality assurance agency, will not just look at the institution and make sure that it is doing what it has set out to do, but make sure that it is also doing something which is valuable for society, for its region, for its society, for the nation. And I think many, some countries in Africa are doing this. And the one example that comes to mind immediately is South Africa, which has a very, very good quality assurance system. Uh, external quality assurance system. And in its quality assurance uh, methodology, it includes fitness for purpose, but also fitness of purpose. And I think this is appropriate for Africa at this particular stage. The thing about fitness of purpose is that it cannot be static because society changes. The requirement of society, the needs of society will change. So you have to modify the, 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 the whole fitness of purpose at different periods. You can't just decide at one particular time. Let me say a few words about ranking because ranking has been mentioned. I do not think, at least in the African context, that ranking is of any interest, of any importance at all to African universities. It's a completely different ball game. It's a game that I think African universities should not get into and play that game. It has uh, many, many more challenges to deal with. And it, those who are interested, those who have the capacity, those who have the uh, financial resources to try and get ranked internationally, good luck to them. I think Africa has other priorities. It should try and get away from ranking, but that doesn't mean it should not benchmark itself with other universities and compare itself with other universities in Africa or even elsewhere. That's a different story. It is not ranking. Thanks. Thank you, Gulam. Since you, you have the floor, let me uh, share with you one of the questions on the, the stages of the, uh, the endorsement of the African Union of the, the new qualifications, quality, and quality assurance uh, principles that you just mentioned. If you could enlighten us in, in terms of likely implementation in the very near future. Okay, the, uh, the one that I mentioned, the uh, African standards and guidelines for quality yes. assurance. Uh, as far as I know, it has been, it has gone through the basic machinery. This has started way back in 2017. It took a long process. It's now available in different languages uh, of you, that are used in Africa, that is English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. And it is not uh, prescriptive. It's a guidelines and each country must look at it and adopt it according to its own local situation. But as far as I know, it has the blessing of the African Union, which means that since most African countries are part of that, all African countries are part of the African Union, I should think it's a, it's a strong instrument to be able to use and adapt in any African country and make use of it. And it's some of the, some of the clauses, they're extremely powerful. Um, and, and by the way, uh, most of the quality assurance agencies in Africa were involved in the drafting. It was done as a joint team between uh, the uh, European quality assurance agencies 
and the African Quality Assurance Agencies. It was a joint venture because it was funded basically by the European Union. Um, I would advise anybody interested to get a copy of it online, have a look at it, and then try and see whether they can adopt it and adapt it for their own country. Yeah, I think it can make a huge difference. Thank you very much, Gulam. I would like to come back to Kamin's point about the present crisis and how uh, from, you know, within a few days, uh, maximum one, two weeks, uh, a large number of universities have switched suddenly to online learning. Now, as Kamin was pointing out, in many countries, quality assurance for online education is distinct from uh, for the other institution. And in some countries, I've observed myself that, in fact, you have sometimes a negative uh, a prejudice against online education that can maybe be reflected in the quality assurance criteria. And uh, how are we going to make this flexible in the present crisis? Would any one of our panelists like to take on this issue? I don't have a definitive answer. However, uh, I think the, the, uh, the virus is going to sustain for a while. It won't dis disappear in a short while. And therefore, any uh, rigid policy will not work. And uh, flexibility, as you hinted at, is important. That is, things will become more diverse. Uh, and then in that case, you may say autonomy academic autonomy or the autonomy in terms of teaching uh, should, should be very important. That is, there should be a kind of a blossoming of different ways of handling it. Different countries and different societies, different institutions. There shouldn't be any one definitive direction that every institution should follow or every teacher should follow. Uh, this is the only thing we can say because it's so 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 young and so new to us, but it's going to have long-term effects. But one thing that which is not only about, or not all about quality assurance is it unveiled the kind of a social disparity when things go home, when learning goes home, and so it's up to the up to society to decide whether we should tackle those disparity because. In the very short term future, uh, online communications become very common. And in this rapid growth of globalization, despite the kind of reverse uh, trends, currents, I think it is going to become a common component, I would say component of uh, all university teaching. And therefore, I think higher education has to be Higher education institutions have to be very uh, prepared for that. But how quality assurance comes in, I don't have an answer. So, Bianca, would you like to address this issue? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, actually, um, based on what Kai just said about. Uh, social differences in uh, being able to accept distance learning. I think that universities should do their maximum to come back to classical learning if they don't want to help this divide being larger be, uh, between those who can do it online easily with all kind of equipment and those who cannot. So I think that universities should really concentrate to offer decent education to those who cannot do it online and even if there is a pressure to move more and more to online because it's easier it's more convenient um, in many other ways uh, i think that as long as the uni university is not able to provide decent online uh, attendance to every of the students, it should insist on not uh, promoting online education. And that I see at this point is the only way to somehow balance this social discrepancy, which we are all first uh, faced with uh, all around the world. 
Emil, just want to add. Helen, how is it likely to play out? See, play, uh, Helen, go ahead, please. No, no. So I just wanted to add that um, the online um, situation in Hong Kong, we, we, I mean, in a way, we, we were unfortunate in having to sort of kickstart it as a result of the protest last year. Um, but we're fortunate in that, you know, the, the COVID has made us, it was given us a second chance to sort of do it again. I think the issue for me would be the quality of the learning experience, right? So let's say for, a Hong, for Hong Kong U, we're, we're quite geared up towards online learning as an institution. My concern would be whether our students are, okay? So we assume that, oh, you know, you come to Hong Kong U, you're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a computer, you're going to have a network. And actually that's not true because we have students all around the world and there will be students who don't have access, have access to internet at all, wherever they're from. So I think we have to really think about um, the quality of the students' learning experience, whether or not they can access it. I mean, we can deliver, but can they access? That's one, that's one issue. The second issue is the quality of our own teachers. So even, um, so, so now we're moving from a, a traditional face-to-face um, sort of learning environment to an online environment and actually they're very they're two very different things so you may have the pedagogical skills to deliver when you're face to face with your students but that does not mean that you have this that you can actually transfer those skills into an online environment I mean there will be some some skills you can but there'll be a whole range of um, new skills that you will need to acquire in order to deliver your content and actually to engage the students as well. So I think what universities can do um, is to train or to provide assistance to teachers on how to deliver an online class. Cause it's absolutely not the same thing to, you know, when you're faced with a room full of students or even a lecture hall full of students, it's not the same as just as talking to maybe, I don't know, four or 500 students online. So I think, you know, that there are, there are issues. There are two different levels for me. And um, we're coming back to autonomy. I guess in, in, in the current crisis, um, you know, we do have the autonomy to go and do these things because we, we've had to really sort of um, hit the ground running. Okay, so we, we've had to just put together all of this stuff, but no one's saying to us, oh no, you can't do it like that. Or, you know, you, you should be doing it this way. I think the, you know, the crisis has given us opportunity and actually autonomy to sort of experiment with new things. Just because there's, you know, we don't have a playbook yet. I and mean, we're, actually, we're actually developing that playbook as we go along. But I think we do need to, you know, as we do that, consider how we can continue to improve this experience. Because absolutely, I think long term, we will be doing a lot more of this online teaching and learning. Mm. Now, Helen, you're talking about all these challenges in the context of very rich, well-endowed university. How much more complicated is it likely to be in the African context, uh, Gulam, where uh, just having a device, a laptop or a tablet is something of a privilege, where connection is maybe an issue, where just having power supply during most hours of the day may be a big challenge. Precisely, Jamil. And I think uh, it's interesting that uh, Bianca was talking about uh, the European situation and Helen and Kainan was talking about uh, the Southeast Asian situation. And just compare these two regions with the African region from the economic point of view, from the social point of view, completely different. And how uh, I fully agree that I think we don't, we should not blindly go into this online teaching without planning and without understanding what it is. What's happening uh, from what I understand in most universities in Africa is the lectures are being put online. You record the lecture and you put it online. That's not online teaching, completely different. Or notes, lecture notes are being delivered to students. But even if, suppose this worked, precisely the point you made, in many rural areas in Africa, you know, the students don't have a laptop, don't have, you know, the electricity, don't have internet. So when you talk of, of quality assurance, how are you going to measure the quality 
of a particular program when 50% of the students can't even really participate in, in, uh, you know, in the teaching and learning activities. That's going to be the biggest challenge for African universities. Thank you very much. One of the questions that came from the, the audience was that in the role of government vis-a-vis -vis quality assurance, the autonomy of quality assurance agency, and perhaps a new role of quality assurance in terms of enhancement, to use Helen's word, or in terms of facilitation. Um, would any of the panelists would like to address this question? Jamil, sorry, can no you just repackage that again? <laughs> question, really. Yeah. It's, can you be more specific, please? Well, the question was, uh, if as I interpreted it, to what extent are we moving towards a different role of quality assurance agencies, rather than uh, being enforcers of quality or defining standards, being more facilitator and institutions using um, self-accreditation, using their internal quality assurance uh, processes and uh, criteria, taking a much more autonomous role in uh, the quality assurance, quality enhancement process. Um, I'll just, just say very quickly, if I may, Jamil, um, I think for me, the quality, just looking at the landscape, the quality assurance continuum, I think if you start from a very sort of fundamental level, it's about mechanisms and processes and systems. And, and this is entirely a personal view, having, having been in quality assurance for quite a while. So the systems, mechanisms and processes are, I think, the easy things to deal with because you know it's 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 quite a, a tick box have you ensured that your teachers have you know been inducted yes you know do your students have um you know a feedback mechanism yes so you've got that that part there which i think is is, is fundamental it's important but what as an institution matures in terms of its teaching and learning and research agenda um, we should be moving away from that sort of tick box culture and much more towards that, like, like I said before, the enhancement culture and asking those questions, is this what really, is this really what we want to do with the students? Is, is this what we want the students to learn? And for me, quality is um, doing the right thing for your students and your teachers, even when no one is looking. So if we see what we have now is a culture where the QA agencies or authorities, it's almost like um, they're big brother and they're, they're, they're sort of looking at us and making sure that we've done all these things. But actually in a, in a truly mature system, we should be doing that regardless of, of whoever's watching us. Because, you know, in terms of the education endeavor, you know, we, we, we're very concerned about what students are learning and how they're learning. And we're actually concerned as teachers how we're teaching and you know what are we doing to improve our teaching so i see it i see quality assurance as a as a continuum from assurance which i think is is um is fundamental but easier to um enhancement which is you know a lot more complex because how do you enhance what do you enhance you know and who who makes a judgment about what 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 should be enhanced but ultimately it's really about uh, do, doing the right thing when no one's looking. And, and, I, and I always ask myself, okay, um, would I um, attend this program? Or, you know, would I um, ask, or would I recommend this program to someone's, someone's child, you know, to, to sort of indicate, you know, the, the, the quality there? I mean, that those are different perspectives that you can take. So I, I, I see it as a continuum. And I think each jurisdiction's, you know, they're at different parts of that or different points. Um, may I, Jamil? Um, Please, go on. Yeah. Spanka, you want to take over? No. Uh, yes, look, uh, actually. Okay, let's go see right? Bianca first and then Gulam, please. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. 
uh, I think that that really is the question of confidence. Uh, uh, relating to what Helen just said, uh, I think that the QA agency or whatever is just uh, providing the information that this institution is, there is a possibility, it's capable of doing something in a quality uh, manner. And yet, it all depends on the people inside whether they are going to use this potential or not going to use this potential, as uh, Helen said, whether uh, as a teacher you are going to give maximum of yourself each time or not each time and so on. And this is something uh, nobody can guarantee. And this is something where institutional autonomy, the institutional government should take place. So external evaluation is just uh, guaranteeing or witnessing that you have potential and the way in which you're using your potential it depending on the management of the institution. That's how I would kind of separate these two problems. Okay, I, I think, thank you. I Good think. luck. Could, could you also then use this opportunity to do your final comments Coming because up. we are coming getting to the end of our session, time is flying. Okay, uh, well, uh, go ahead. Uh, there were right. really so many questions and sorry. comments and I was impressed and uh, oh. actually I'm sorry that we cannot answer to all of them. Uh, uh, I think that we need more and more webinars like this in order to really come to some conclusion. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, I honestly think, at least for European universities, it's extremely important to relate autonomy to accountability, which has never been seriously done in this 800 uh, years long history of universities. And if we manage to do it, we will solve the problem. And thank, very all for, uh, thank you all for this nice talk. Thank you okay, very much, uh, Bianca. Over to you, Gulam. Yeah, and right. then we'll finish so, with Kai Ming. Yeah. So let me let me first look at uh, this issue of uh, the role of quality assurance about whether it should be quality enhancement and so on. Actually, the trend in the world more and more is for quality assurance agencies not to act as policemen, but to try and assist and help institutions to to, to have good quality. The African standards and guidelines uh, that I mentioned earlier on, I mentioned a principle that it has to be autonomous. First of all, universities must be autonomous. The second principle clearly lays out that the responsibility for quality rests with the institutions itself and that the external quality assurance should be just a facilitator, an enhancer, a helper. And I think this is the guiding principle that is used, being used in Europe. And I think in Africa, we're moving towards the uh, same route. After all, the principle is that the responsibility for ens ensuring quality must be the higher education institution, the university itself. It knows what it's doing. It must make sure through an internal quality assurance system ensure that there is quality in whatever it does, whether it is teaching, whether it's research, whether it's community service or whatever. And the external thing then comes in just to assure, just to make sure that everything is, go, is, is, is going all right. That, that would be my view. Let me say a few words in, in summary since we are ending in a few minutes. I think the whole issue of autonomy um, is very pertinent for Africa at this particular period in time. Uh, we have been evolving positively over the years, as far as autonomy is concerned, in African universities, but one cannot generalize for the whole continent. In some places, things have gone worse. In other places, things have gone better. Uh, and, but I think governments must understand, must appreciate that autonomy is so important for universities to thrive. Otherwise, you will not get good higher education institutions. And as I mentioned, uh, quality assurance, especially the way things are evolving in Africa, can play a very significant role. I think the uh, latest development taking place in Africa through the African standards and guidelines, through new and new 
quality assurance agencies being set up through the networks of quality assurance that we're seeing uh, coming up only recently, barely a couple of months ago, the African, uh, the Francophone African countries grouped together, the agencies, the quality assurance agencies grouped together to form a network precisely for the same reason, to share experiences, to build, uh, um, you know, to understand what, what the importance of, of, of quality assurance and to encourage autonomy. And they're not funded by government at all. So I think uh, there are positive signs ahead. Uh, unfortunately, I must say that I'm not entirely convinced that COVID-19 will not have an impact on everything that is happening positively so far in Africa. It is, that's, that's my assessment, uh, but let's see how things evolve as we go along. I'd like to thank CIQG for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar, which I think is fascinating. Thank my colleagues for their wonderful views and comments, and let's hope we continue to debate on this important issue of autonomy and quality assurance. Thank you. Thank yes, you, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, like, yeah, I would like to go back to what I first said. Universities and higher education are for exploration <clears throat> and moving forward. The danger with quality assurance is it becomes a deficit model. It's like a, like a checking a car to see what's wrong with the car. So eventually it's the original car. The question is what's wrong with you? Whether you have done this? The question should be different for a higher education institution is what will be your next plan? What will be you become in five years time? What was your next target? And that unfortunately is not always what the government is thinking. Government policies always, government funding always looking at things that are predictable, that are in order. And when your universities are moving outside the box, it's not always understandable by governments, by nature. And therefore, I think the, the, the fundamental uh, difficulty with quality assurance is that it, because it, it assures quality, it doesn't enhance quality and it comes back to Helen's point about enhancement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kai Ming. We've come to the end of the session and I, I would really be unable to summarize all the important messages that uh, our four panelists have shared today. I, I, I'm very grateful to all of you for this very rich conversation. I think we've seen the different facets of how institutional autonomy plays out in various parts of the world and how quality assurance can support institutional autonomy and, and, uh, and be itself enhanced by it. Uh, we've, we've looked at the challenges and tensions between autonomy and accountability. We've, we've, some of you have made the point that quality assurance is not the only instrument for accountability, that uh, sometimes performance-based funding uh, can be useful, that uh, labor market information, and we've, I think we've, we've had a, a general re rejection of rankings as being a, a, a distraction that can be quite harmful. Uh, I think um, Helen, in a way, ca Helen captured very well this uh, evolution from traditional view of quality assurance as enforcement to a much more positive approach, which has to do with enhancement. Um, one word perhaps that we haven't used um, enough today was the word of trust. How government should trust quality assurance agency as a valuable intermediary and how quality assurance agencies themselves must trust high nobody's looking over your show impact of the current pandemic and uh, see how to what it extends the transition to online learning is a um, temporary uh, transition or whether it's going to change and transform high education institutions in the, in the long term. And uh, certainly, I think it's not so much about online versus uh, on campus, but really about having more dynamic, more innovative curriculum design and pedagogical delivery 
And we haven't talked too much enough perhaps about the, the need also to adjust assessment system to the new approaches and to online learning and perhaps quality assurance will help us make the transition in a, more, in a positive way. So I would like to conclude by thanking uh, our panelists, inviting all uh, 200 participants to um, Jardin Week. We cannot have a, a loud applause, but um, we, we are really grateful to their contribution. Salbianca, Gulam, Kaimin, and Helen, thank you so much. And thank you, Judith, Stamanka, and Joel for making this uh, great uh, webinar to bring you for bringing that to us and then thank you to all the participants i've been reading all your comments and I hopefully we can capture them in so in a, oh yes, yes. In, uh, in writing because the, your a lot of very important comments and suggestions and questions have been raised so Thank you, everyone, and uh, hopefully we can meet again soon in uh, another one of these webinars organized by Chia. Thank you over to you, thank you. Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.